good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, we'll give people a few minutes to, to come on board here. Welcome to another episode of Workbench Wednesday. Um, your host Ryan uh, from Lionel and glad to have you back. I'm glad to be sitting with you here at the Workbench again. Uh, this is the start of train season for many of us uh, who don't do it all year round. Um, so I uh, wanted to, based on some tips we had from one of our uh, last programs, uh, take some time tonight and talk a little bit about fast track and some tips and tricks for getting the most out of your model railroad. Even if you're not using Lionel's fast track, I think you'll find some things uh, that we go over here tonight uh, to be very helpful for you in whatever type of track that you're using, whatever type of scale and gauge that you're using. Uh, so a lot of these things are, are universal. Um, as we're waiting for some more people to come on, uh, I'll just cover a little bit of other other business and let you know some other things. Uh, we have been unloading containers uh, all week long. I think we had about seven come in today uh, to uh, full of products. So we are getting in uh, a massive amount of shipments every day uh, and racing against the clock to try and get everything we can turned and shipped out to our, our dealers and directly to our, our customers. Um, uh, as best as we can uh, for the holiday season. So if you're if you're looking for your your Christmas sets or your Christmas rolling stock, have no fear. Uh, we are unloading things daily. Um, this today we unloaded uh, Polar Express sets, uh, CNO sets. Christmas rolling stock came in uh, today. Uh, from the high end, we unloaded the SW8s uh, on Monday. So uh, those Legacy diesels will be be heading out. Tested one of those and it runs beautifully. Uh, so. Uh, lots of lots of uh, wonderful product coming in every day, and I, we always get questions on here. So I wanted to let you let you know that we are are getting things in and turning them as quickly as possible to, to get them to you in time for the holidays. Um, we'll be doing speaking of the holidays next Monday at six thirty. Tune into Train World TV. I'll be on with our our friends there at Train World, Ken Bianco. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, holiday trains. We'll talk a little bit about the Vision Class A for next year uh, and just the start of the holiday season there and, and having some fun. So um, I'll announce that again at the end of the show. But uh, next Monday, probably won't be doing demos with Dave, but we'll have a, a special Christmas show with our friends at Train World next Monday to enjoy. So uh, hopefully you'll all be able to catch catch up with us on that. we got a, a pretty good crowd forming in here. Thank you and hello to everyone who has... Uh, who said hi to say hi? Uh, we're glad to have you all on here, uh, and uh, we'll start with uh, tracking. Uh, Rick, you, you've got the the question of the night right there. How to clean tra fast track is always debatable. How do you clean it? Um, and that is really um, a great question. And and how do you clean track? Whether it's Lionel fast track or any track, is one of the great never ending debates in model train circles. Um, it, it's it's like uh, whether or not to put nail holes in scale buildings for the the model builders, it's uh, where Penn Central Diesel runs with green or black. Uh, these are the debates that time nor evidence will never never stop. So, um, how do we clean fast track? Let me start by telling you how we don't clean fast track. Uh, you don't want to use anything that is super abrasive. So sandpaper, uh -uh. steel roll, steel wool, definitely not in the bag. Um, what those products will do is scratch the surface of the rail. And let me switch over here and bring the workbench camera in a little bit, bit brighter. You want to make sure as you're doing this that you don't create more abrasions on the top of the rail surface. That's uh, the main reason. That gives, that gives the dirt and oils and things a place to collect. So you want to keep the top of your rail clean, but you want to keep it smooth. So anything really abrasive like sandpaper, even a fine sandpaper, is going to add fine fine grooves in there. And if you if you take it over your track, if you look real closely at it, you'll be able to see that. Uh, and while it'll clean the dirt, it'll it'll definitely get you going for a little while. Over time, it's going to catch up to you, and you're going to have a bigger problem. Steel wool does the same thing, but it has the added problem that those little fibers get loose. And then the magnets in your locomotive armatures and the motors pull those things in, and then you get all sorts of mechanical problems in your in your engine. So definitely don't use steel wool. Definitely don't use uh, a sandpaper. If you want to use anything for friction, what I recommend is a track a special track cleaning eraser. You can find those at hobby shops. You can also use the white erasers that you get at um, an office supply store for erasing inks. Not the not the big pink ones from your pencil. They're, they're too soft, and you'll just get little pink 
crumbs all over the place. But the, the white erasers do a very good job of getting uh, some of the more stubborn uh, stuck on things off. There are two other main uh, answers that people go with, and a lot of people fall in one camp or the other. Um, and the uh, those those are rubbing alcohol and a, a citrus cleaner like Goo Gone. I have used both, uh, and I've had good lucks with both. Um, some people uh, stay away from one or the other for a variety of reasons. As long as you aren't soaking your track in these things and leaving it on for a long time, you're not going to have any any issues. Uh, some people say that the citrus cleaners leave a little bit of a film. Uh, with O-gauge trains, I don't think it's much of an issue because as soon as you start running those trains, it's going to take that right off for you. So denatured alcohol is what I use. I've got, uh, it's fine, you're finally able to get it again. I've got some 91% here. And just put a little bit on a paper towel. Whoops, I spilled that out way too fast. And you want to just rub on the top of your track. This is fairly clean track, so you probably won't get a whole lot off of it there. But you can see I'm getting some dirt off right away. It does not take a lot of effort. Focus on the top of the rail and focus on the inside edge of the rail. All right, so you want to focus up here and in here where your flanges are going to be rubbing. And you want to get, of course, all three rails, uh, the center rail for your, your contacts and both outer rails. A little bit of elbow grease doesn't hurt, uh, but you'll start to see that, that you do get uh, pretty clean results. As far as the road bed goes, you probably get similar results there as well. Um, if you have any dirt or grime that gathers on the ties and the, and the track, you can wipe it off with this also. Um, the uh, Some people actually... I, me included. I actually like it when you get a little bit of that that weathering on the track. I think it helps give it a better uh, better look uh, to the track overall uh, as, as it ages like that. But to each his own. Uh, if you want it, you can also of course ballast this track and uh, and paint it and weather it as much as you'd like. That's how I clean track. The next question is how often do you do this? Uh, and that is as often as necessary. You can't over clean your track really as, as long as you're not using anything uh, too. Uh, too abrasive on it. Um, but if you're starting to see performance issues, yeah, you get, get the, the cloth out and wipe it down. If you're setting up the train uh, for an annual Christmas display, I would wipe it down before you put it away uh, really well, and then give it a quick cleaning when you set it up. Uh, and that'll probably cover you. The, the, the flat surface of the fast track rails um, is really nice because it gives you a wider electrical contact. So you have a little bit more uh, forgiveness in this than some of the smaller scales or more scale uh, scale track pieces out there with a, a more prototypical profile on the railhead. It actually works to your advantage here, a little bit more forgiving for uh, for dirt because you've got more surface area. Um, but that being said, you still want to keep things fairly fairly clean uh, and, and regularly. Uh, it also just keeps the, the dust and, and the grease down. I've had a few good questions come in here. So before I get into some of the other things, let me um, go go in here and answer a few uh, a few questions that that uh, that came up that were were track related. Um, here's a good one. Uh, on, just bought your first uh, BNSF train set. Comes with O36. What's the biggest curve my train can ride on? There's no maximum that you can't use. Uh, your train can always go bigger. What we worry about in um, in, in most model railroads, in most scales, what we actually worry about is the minimum curve. Uh, so what's the tightest curve that you can get your train to go around? Uh, most of our starter sets, I have to say most, there are a few like the Hogwarts set that really does need 036, but the majority of our starter sets will, will go around 031 curve. So if you have older track and, and 031 layouts, uh, 031 in most cases will work for you just fine. 036 for sure for all of our starter sets. Um, and some of the rolling stock will do 027 as well. Uh, but we, though we don't do as much of uh, 027 any any longer. But as far as maximum goes, man, the sky's the limit. As big of a, a radius as you want to put on there, the larger the radius, uh, in my opinion, uh, the better the train looks and the longer and larger uh, equipment that you can run uh, down the road. So if you get if you continue to grow in the hobby and you get bigger locomotives, some of our our scale pieces, uh, you may want bigger curves that you can run some of the longer trains and longer equipment. And uh, our biggest minimum curve, so the, the biggest curve that we make that everything has to go around uh, is, is 072, which is twice the, twice the diameter of your 036. 
So everything that we make will at least operate on 072. Uh, to our, our biggest steam locomotives and, and scale freight cars uh, will all operate on 072. We won't make anything that can't operate at least on 072 curves. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of things that we make that operate on much tighter curves than that uh, in both the traditional and scale world in, in O-Gage. And uh, the for those who are, are new, the, the terminology there, 036, 060, 072, the number refers to the diameter of the track based on the center rail uh, for us. So an 036 curve will be 36 inches across from center rail to center rail. If you were to draw uh, a half circle, that diameter would be 36 inches on an 036 curve. Uh, 072 would be twice that, it'd be six feet. All right, so, um, smaller scales, a lot of people use radius. Um, in the O-gauge world, we use diameter typically, and it's typically measured from the center rail. And that's why when you, if you look at a track set, it'll say it's a 40 by 60 oval of track. Well, it's 036 curve. When you add in the extra inch or so from the uh, center rail to the outside of the road bed, your, your track base is actually 40 inches wide. So we put that in there. So if you're trying to figure out how wide of a platform you need, uh, you have an answer to that. Uh, for S gauge trends, you'll notice there's sort of a difference there too. Um, you know, the Gilbert method was always to use the outside rail so that people knew how big of a, a platform they were going to need for their for their curves, as opposed to a center rail uh, designation. So we've we've used two different uh, radii there in the past. Uh, in our HO sets, we use uh, a, a typical method for for HO world, which is still measured from the center line, but of radius. So our HO sets we have available now have a 20 inch radius uh, curve, which is measured from the center of the track. Uh, so an HO set actually has the same diameter curve uh, overall and the same footprint as one of our O gauge sets. Uh, they just, uh, they are not designed to go quite as tight um, around the corners. We don't put the swinging pilots on the diesels and things like that, for example. Uh, so that's hopefully a quick primer for you all on, on curves and what that all means. You can mix and match track radii uh, as long as you you keep the uh, the minimum to whatever your, your equipment will be running, you can mix and match as much as you want. You can use larger radii to act as an easement into your curves. Um, you can do a whole whole variety of things with it. If you want to do concentric circles, you can put different different circles in there as well. We've got a whole line of fast track that makes it very easy to customize uh, your layout. Switches follow the same designation. So if you're uh, if you want to replace a curve piece with a switch, it will, it will be a direct drop-in. So an 036 switch, an 072 switch, et cetera. It all, all works together on that one. Um, let me see here. I've got a good question. We uh, mentioned American Flyer there. I've got another another good one here. Uh, and, and that is, can you use fast track system uh, with with the O gauge or with, with an S gauge set? And will the original transformer work for the fast tracks? This is good because this, this applies to both American Flyer and to our O-Gage uh, uh, viewers here tonight. If you have the older tubular track, whether it's S-Gage or O-Gage, and you want to upgrade because you like the, the roadbed track, it's, um, you know, or it's just time you've worn out the old track and it's time to replace it, uh, absolutely, those trains will transfer directly over to the new track without any problem. We make a transition piece in both gauges so that if you want to mix and match, you can do that. Uh, and you can, the, the rail heights line up so you can transition right from one to the other. Uh, if you have a lot of switches or you want a section of your layout that just has the older traditional look or for any reason, you can, you can switch back and forth. Uh, but the, the trains, as long as they're the same gauge, will work just fine. Uh, you won't have, any, you won't notice any difference uh, in, in how the train runs from one track to the other. The same is true with our newer trains running on older track. You can run the newer trains on older American Flyer or older traditional tubular style O gauge track. Uh, you won't have any problems doing that. As far as power goes, yes, you can apply power to the track uh, the same way um, you would with either, either of them. You'll use a different style clip on for the fast track uh, than you would the older tubular or uh, flyer track, but same idea. Uh, and, and both AC and DC power uh, in both gauges uh, you can work with there. So great question, and uh, I'm glad that one came up and uh, I could answer that. Also have a great question here on changing the rubber uh, traction tires on the Polar Express O-Gauge. I'm going to cover that in another upcoming uh, video because I want to spend some time talking about traction tires. Very easy to do. 
not going to get into it tonight, but Brian, great question and uh, one that we will get back to. We do have some uh, some helpful videos on that uh, on our service site as well, I believe. So you might want to check a look on, take a look on there, um, and take a look in your instruction manual for the set. Uh, there's a, a, a wrench you simply take off the the side rods. And then it's very easy to pop off the old tire and pop on a new one. We have uh, replacement traction tires coming in the set, and we also have them available through customer service. Uh, so let me get back on the on the track um, track thing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chuck asks, will using weathering paints on the outside of the outer rails cause any issues? Good question. Uh, Chuck, no, it really won't, as long as you keep the paint here on the side of the rail. Uh, as long as you keep the paint on the side of the rail, you won't have any problem. And typically, if you're unless you're using a really crazy paint, you paint the side of the rail. If you get a little bit on the top, rub it off, or the trains are going to take care of it for you uh, in no time anyway to keep that that clean. Um, so, good good question there. Uh, if you like to uh, like to to weather your track a bit, uh, let's see here. We've got. Uh, da, 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 da. Lots of questions as I was answering those come in here. Um, that's great. Let me come on down here. Okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit now about track maintenance and what happens if something goes wrong. The fast track is pretty bulletproof uh, in many cases, but you can wear it out. You can break it. Um, one of the most typical things that that we hear from now now and then is uh, a track pin breaking or a track pin not making uh, contact. And um, the most common one I hear is about the center pin, uh, because the center pin no longer makes contact. These sort of wear themselves loose after a while, um, connecting and uh, reconnecting. Um, the easiest way to fix this, if you're starting to lose connection uh, and you have a dead piece of track, it's usually this, this center piece that, that uh, gives you the problem. And the easiest way to fix this, let me drag the camera here to the edge of the table. Uh, simply take your track lay it down on the surface of the table and press down so that you bend that tip back in towards the center a little bit. All right. As long as you don't slam it, you're not going to break the pin. You don't have anything to worry about. Uh, but a little bit of pressure there, bend that back in the center and you'll get better contact. And that usually, usually solves the problem. Uh, if you break a pin, uh, we do have replacement pins available. And I'm going to put the two numbers up here. Um, but if you go to our uh, our service site and type in Fast Track, uh, and you'll get a, a whole list of things that have parts in there, and um, you'll be able to uh, to look that that up. Um, if you need to replace a center pin, here's the part number, uh, and you can go into the site and order these directly from us. Very easy to to do. Uh, and if you need the outside pin, again, these numbers are on lionel.com. Uh, this is the outside pin number. Uh, if, you, if you don't have, uh, if, you, if you don't need one right now, and you think, oh, I'm, I'm never going to remember those numbers, go on lionel.com, go to the service uh, support page, uh, type fast track into the search engine, and you'll get a list of places. Click on a 10-inch piece of track, and it'll it'll pull up these pin numbers. There aren't that many parts, fortunately, to have to have to worry about. So um, uh, these are these are the, the two parts that tend to to wear out the, the most. Um, talk a little bit about how you can replace these. This is something you can do yourself, um, and all you have to do is, is flip the track over. On the underside of the track, you're going to find uh, a set of bent-over tabs. Uh, for each rail. Uh, and there are, depending on the length of the track, there are a multitude of these. And you simply want to take a screwdriver and bend each tab up. Get underneath there, this is a bit of a big screwdriver. Okay, bend each tab up, uh, loosen the pieces, and then you'll press down from the top to separate the piece a little bit. Switch over to another track. I already did this ahead of time so that uh, you wouldn't have to watch me bend tabs for five minutes. Uh, you'll be able to then lift this, this rail right off. Okay, so here you see the tabs on the bottom of the track and uh, the the out, this is the outside curve rail. All the tracks come off the same way. 
You don't necessarily have to pull the whole rail off to replace a pin. You can probably start from one end and just get it loose enough. But just to make it easier, I took took that piece off there. If anyone's ever wondered what the inside of a fast track rail looks like, uh, you see here we've got um, a row of plastic supports that uh, help support that stamped metal rail and also help deaden the sound a little bit um, inside inside that track. The rail itself is just a stamped uh, piece of metal stamped into a U shape. And then uh, this gets pressed in at the factory and the tabs folded over. Uh, these little tabs here at the end are what get folded over to hold it in place. With that out, you can uh, very easily get to the end of the track there. This is the pin. This is the outside rail pin. It just simply sits in a, uh, in a little hole there and then the rail holds it in place. So take out your broken pin, put in your new pin, and then we'll lay the track rail back over, feeding the uh, tabs back into the holes, and be able to then press down and everything should pop back into place. That makes sense if you, if you have to get it all in at the same time. couple of things you can do if you have if the end is loose pair needle nose pliers give it a little crimp here uh, and get that good and tight so you're making contact between the pin and the rail on the underside now we can just come back through and bend back down these tabs this isn't something you should ever really have to do often but if you ever have to replace a fast track pin this is how you do it you don't immediately have to throw away the piece of track for a, uh, a pin that cost a and under a buck and once we bend those tabs back in we'll be good to go well i have the track upside down there's one more little fun feature here i want to show you and that's this bus bar and we've talked about this in the past um, what this bus bar does is it connects the power from the one outside rail to the other outside rail so when we connect this to our layout you can use the uh, the little tabs that come on here and use a spade terminal it will slide right on so you don't have to do any soldering or you can solder directly to the uh, the tabs if you need to add more feeders and want to keep them hidden uh, we've covered that in a past episode of workbench wednesday on uh, track and wiring and i'll show you another example of that again here tonight uh, but this tab uh, is what creates that um, connection between the two rails the wire from the the term, uh, transformer only goes to one of the outside rails. These bus bars are on every piece of track and they make the connection. Now, if you look underneath one of our um, light up sections of track, uh, which are very popular this time of year, you'll see that there are, are no bus, bar, no bus wires, uh, bus bars in here. And that's because these are set up as an um, insulated outside rail uh, section on each piece of track so that when the car passes over that section, it lights up the track, uh, the LEDs in that individual track bed. Um, the same uh, technique can be used for activating any number of trackside accessories. So if you wanna have a railroad crossing, for example, that turns on and off as the train goes past, you can use um, an accessory activation track, which connects uh, which uses this circuit to, uh, to connect uh, your accessory. So one wire goes to the transformer, the other gets wired through this track section uh, and then back so that as the train goes across the track, it completes that circuit and activates your accessory. If you want to extend that accessory track, we sell straight tracks that uh, already have that bus bar removed, but you can make any piece of fast track an insulated outside rail section by simply removing this bus bar. So if you're using that on any of your track circuits, this is a really easy thing you can do. You bend up the two tabs, you pop out this bar, and you've got an insulated outside rail section. And should you ever want to reverse it, just put the bar back in. Uh, it's not a, not a problem at all. So if you're customizing your layout and you want to have uh, insulated tracks like that uh, that aren't straight pieces, uh, very easy to do this, and you don't have to, to worry about buying custom pieces of track or uh, cutting more gaps in your rails and, and all that kind of kind of fun stuff. Um, so very, very easy, uh, easy fix on that and a great way to customize your layout. 
while we're on the subject of the lighted tracks, uh, I get questions from time to time of, can I mix and match lighted track with uh, conventional track? And absolutely you can. Uh, it all works together. Uh, can I use, I had a question over the weekend from a, a dealer of whether or not you could use the lighted track with a, um, an AC transformer. Yes, you can. We have a uh, protection built into, uh, into each of these track sections to do that. Um, if you've never seen a light up track before, it's really cool. Uh, looks great under a Christmas tree. Uh, we've got one of our test cars here. I'm going to demonstrate here as we put the car on the track, the wheels complete the circuit. So as you go from one track to another, zoom out a little bit. As you go from one track to another, the lights follow the train. And you can mix this with, with regular track, of course, as much as you like. We have this available separately. Um, and we have uh, a complete oval pack if you want to buy it that way. We have straights and curves. We get lots of requests for different colors of lights and different, um, different uh, configurations of track. Uh, I'm sure the line will grow over time. Um, the question is, you know, how many directions can we take it? So uh, that's another fun way to uh, customize your track. One more thing we talked about a little bit here. Um, we talked about making those power connections. There are a variety of connections that you can make on your on your track. Most of our sets today come with a, a simple plug-in uh, barrel jack, like you saw here on the uh, fast track power piece. So that all you have to do to get started is plug in your wall pack and plug in your track and you're good to go. As your layout gets larger, uh, then you can uh, you may want to add more power sections. But you don't necessarily have to add another power supply. You just want to make sure that you're getting the power all around your layout. And we've talked about this in the past with bus wires and feeder wires. Uh, another thing that you can do uh, to help with that process is make the connection at each rail joint. So what I've done here, we did this on a past episode, uh, but I had it handy, so I brought it back out so you can see it again. Uh, this is a simple set of bus wires, uh, or jumper wires, I should say, from one section of fast track to another. We have one small wire that goes from uh, tab to tab on the inside rail, and another on one of the outside rails. And you'll notice on our fast track, there's a little notch cut into the end of these tracks to accommodate just exactly this sort of thing. So that you can run those two wires, then bend them down, uh, and they lay right in that channel, and your track will lay flat. Uh, and you'll, you'll never have that, that problem. What this does is it effectively bypasses those uh, mechanical joints uh, at the connection. It makes it harder to take your track apart because you now have a wired connection underneath. So this is more along the lines of something you would do for a more permanent layout. However, heat up your soldering iron, tap the end of these wires, they're going to pop right off, and you can separate your track again. It's certainly not permanent. Um, but that's, uh, that's a good, um, good, good tip if you're building a larger layout. This will get you on a, on a, on a slightly, slightly larger than your typical oval, but not a large layout. You don't want to run bus wires. This will certainly help uh, extend your, the range of your, your power supply, even if you only have the, uh, the, one, uh, the one source of power. As your railroad gets bigger, though, you'll want to uh, run a bus wire underneath the layout, and then you can connect... Uh, your track to that with, with feeder wires. Again, we've done that in a past video. I'm not going to repeat it all tonight uh, for, for the sake of time. Um, and if you're just setting up your track for around the Christmas tree, it's not something you need to worry about. But you can always connect, make connections to any of these uh, prongs on the bottom of the track. And every piece of Fast Track also has a plug-in uh, spot here where if you want to use our spade uh, connections, and our uh, pre-wired um, track feeders like we use in our, with our uh, electrical transformers. Um, I'll put this number up here as well. Uh, you can buy these through service uh, also. Uh, and that's the fast track terminal wire. Uh, and that comes with a, a spade connection at each end already. It's a red black wire. So you just plug it right on there, no soldering, no, no worry at all. So for those who, uh, don't have a soldering iron, don't want, don't want to have a soldering iron, and don't want to get that technical into the hobby, we still got you covered uh, as, as you want to grow your layout. Very easy to do. Um, but don't be afraid of the skills. That's what we're, that's what we're here for on, on tonight's program also, is to, 
uh, help you grow and learn new things. That's one of the, the best parts about this hobby, uh, all the fun things you can do with it. Uh, so I've got a few more co uh, questions that have come in. Uh, I want to try and uh, get to some of these, um, especially the track-related ones. Uh, is there a track package for S-Gage? Uh, sorry, I don't see one on your web page. We have, uh, I don't think we have as many expansion packs for S-Gage just because of the volume that we uh, that we do. Um, but uh, we do have a, a whole assortment of S-Gage fast track. Uh, switches, different lengths of straights, different radius curve, uh, so uh, crossings. Uh, there's there's a, a lot that you can still do with that. Um, you'll, you'll probably want to have to piece it together a la carte. Um, but uh, you can do that on our web web page, or see some of our dealers who carry S gauge also, and they can uh, they can definitely steer you in the right direction for what you need. Uh, if you look in the catalog uh, and look online, it should tell you how many curve sections you need, for example, to make a, a circle, so you you know how many pieces you'll you'll need uh, from the beginning. Uh, in, in O gauge, we have a little bit more. We have some uh, track packs like uh, figure eight add ons, uh, inside o, inside uh, passing sidings, and things like that. Uh, that are designed to expand the track that comes in your typical starter set. Uh, but of course, as always, you can uh, you can go a la carte and uh, get as much as you need. We have seen a huge run on fast track over the last uh, two years, and we're not alone in that. Uh, we've, I've heard this from other train manufacturers who make track uh, as well. Uh, a lot of people um, have had a chance to stay home and work on layouts uh, finally. Uh, whether they expected to or not. And so a lot of people started building model trains uh, over the last couple of years and, and taking their trains out of the out of the boxes and, and building a platform for the first time. It's one of the things that sparked us to, to want to do this, this program and, and help you along the way. Uh, so we have been out of some some track, uh, in and out of track, stock on track over the past year. And the track is starting to flow in again. Uh, I know I unloaded some 10-inch some straights today uh, and there, there's more track coming. Um, so... Uh, we're trying to catch back up again in demand. We put in our largest track orders uh, in the history of recent history memory of this company uh, over this last year. So uh, that's encouraging for us, not just because, you know, it, it means good sales, but it, track sales are, dem are, are a demonstration that the hobby is doing well and that people are actually uh, getting these trains out and running them and having fun with them and building the layout. Uh, and that's uh, for, for, Guys like us who are in the in the business, but also in the hobby, we like seeing that. It means that you're having as much fun with these trains as we are. Uh, I, I I like seeing that people aren't just buying them and putting the boxes on a shelf and uh, you know saving them as their retirement fund or something like that. Get them and play with them. Have fun with them. That's what that's what it's for. Um, so another uh, question here: uh, Can you get the terminal wires in various lengths? No, we only have them in one length. Um, of course, you can always splice wire and, and things like that. Um, this is where supplying a, a one size fits all, um, uh, program gets a little bit more challenging, uh, for us as a manufacturer because everyone's layout's different. That's the fun part of the hobby. Uh, so for us to have the right length of wire for everybody, uh, doesn't always work. Um, but once you get a couple standard, uh, a few of our wires and you look at it and you go, okay, I see what I'm doing here. Uh, then go to your local home center. Uh, and get a spool of, uh, I usually recommend 14 gauge wire for your bus, uh, anything from 18 to 22 gauge wire for your feeders, uh, depending on how long they're going to be. The shorter the length of run of your wire, the smaller the diameter can be. So like you saw here on our, our track, this is some fairly fine wire. I believe this is a 22 gauge uh, solid wire. For a feeder, I recommend a number 14 gauge uh, stranded wire, and that's standard uh, uh, standard wire size that's used in residential wiring. So uh, very easy to find. You can get it in a multitude of, col uh, of colors, which is helpful if you're building multiple loops uh, of track or separating your railroad into power districts. You can use different colors for different tracks, and then when you're under the layout trying to figure out what you did wrong, you can trace the circuits that much easier. So highly recommend color coding your, your wires and then writing down what color wire goes to what section uh, somewhere where you'll, you'll remember it, uh, because if you don't write it down, you'll, you'll probably forget. All these little tips come from personal experience, of course, uh, usually learned the hard way. Uh, so definitely, um, definitely take a look at, at that. Um, but you can get that wire uh, anywhere. Wire, like everything, is uh, not cheap and getting more expensive, but um, it's uh, it's easy to easy to come by and um, 
then you can tailor it to your own, own needs as you build your layout. But if you're looking for something uh, simple to get you started to make those connections, we do have those, those fast track terminals. I want to say it's about a 12 inch or so, 12, 14 inches, maybe 16 inches uh, stretch of wire. Uh, give or take. Uh, I haven't unspooled one in a while, but that, that's about the average length of them. And for that gauge of wire, that's uh, probably a pretty good good run. Uh, they were designed really to connect a transformer to a loop of track. And that's So that, that's typical of what, what you'd see. Okay. Uh, is there a way to turn a manual switch into a remote switch with fast track? Not right now. Uh, our track switches are designed either as remote or manual from the factory, and that's because all of the guts are built into the roadbed of the track. Uh, I didn't bring the switch home with me to, to show, uh, but if you flip one over, you'll see a nice flat cover plate on there and everything that controls that switch is packed inside. Uh, and if you ever wanna see um, a, a crazy nightmare, unpack, un unscrew one of those terminals and look inside a fast track switch. Um, there's a lot going on in there, a lot more than you'd expect. Um, to make sure that everything uh, functions properly with the auto derail and uh, and everything else that those switches do for you. Uh, so we only sell the remote command and the, the manual switches separately right now. Uh, down the road, we're looking at different things we can do with our switches, but uh, for right now, you want to get one or the other. Now, one thing we have done over the past almost five years, six years now, uh, we used to have manual switches, remote controlled switches, and command remote switches. Uh, the command control switches have a, uh, a receiver in there to work with legacy uh, so that uh, you can control the switch remotely with your um, TMCC or legacy uh, cab uh, and do it remotely. And uh, for a while, we made switches with and without that feature to help, help control cost. But we've managed to get the cost of the receiver down to where we, we combined it uh, and put them in, now they're, they're in everything. So whether or not you use that feature right away, if you build a layout and you've got those switches and uh, they're, they're all remote control switches uh, and you decide at some point you wanna stop using the included uh, lever that comes with it, uh, you can go command control. Uh, are there any new plans for fast track railroad crossing? Uh, o gauge, we have them. Um, we don't have one in uh, S gauge right now, uh, but we do have several railroad crossings uh, available uh, in fast track, we have them with uh, flashing lights. We have one with uh, lights and gates. Um, and uh, um, I'd love to tell you that there's another new one coming down the road, but I probably get in trouble for that. So I didn't just tell you that there's another cool new crossing coming out uh, at some point in the, in the not too distant future. We're working on some designs right now. Um, but we always do, do have a number of those. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the program, it's very easy to set up your fast track to control those crossings without any uh, hard to do wiring or detection circuits or anything like that. You can use the outside rails uh, to do all of those uh, detections for you as, as you go. Um, so, so great question there. Uh, any wigwags? We used to have a classic wigwag um, signal um, in the line. I have to double check and see if we've got the tooling for that because uh, wigwag is a pretty cool signal. Uh, I'd like to like to see us bringing that that in. Um, just sort of scan back over here uh, through the comments. Bear with me just a second here. Uh, what happened to all the TMCC speeders? They are on the production schedule. Uh, they were taken off because they're going on the water. Uh, they probably came off a little bit early, but trust me, they are made. We've seen the production samples of those. Uh, I can't give you an arrival date just yet. Um, the <laughs> the shipping schedule is a little bit wonky, as you, you may have guessed, uh, based off of... Um, what you, I'm sure have heard in the news uh, from everybody about uh, our, our shipping uh, problems uh, worldwide right now. But uh, we will definitely be having a, uh, uh, we, we'll be definitely getting those in uh, and they're on their, their way. Um, Charlie's asking, uh, has a legacy H10 running on 042 track and the sound cuts out on curves and then comes back on, on the straight track. Any idea how to fix? Um, could be something to do with the, the pickup on the, on the track. Um, give us a call uh, in customer service on that one, Charlie, and we'll, we'll help you walk through that. Um, it's, it's probably also worth just taking a quick, quick wipe with the, uh, the cleaner like we, we talked about at the top of this program uh, on your curves and see if that, that has any impact. But I don't really think it's dirty track if it's consistently over uh, all your curves and then coming back on one of the straights. Uh, so just give us a, give us a call. Uh, the company and service will, will, will help you out on, on that. 
Uh, let's see if we've got any more um, more good ones here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. All right. Chuck wants a fast track banjo signal. That's another oddity. Uh, Philly Rail, any news on the tooling sample of Strasburg 90s? Uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me on that. Uh, I don't usually talk product on here, but um, it's, you know, it's the Christmas season, so uh, why not? Uh, I just looked at the final drawings this morning uh, for the tender with uh, some new uh, details added from our, our, our trip there in October. So those designs are coming along very well. I've seen some early shots of the, the samples um, at the factory. I, I'm hoping to have them in pretty soon uh, so that you can, uh, so we can show them off and, and let everybody see them. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll get them quite by the end of this, uh, um, this, this year or not. Um, I've told the factory, take the time, get it right, uh, and, and send it over in its best form. Uh, so we'll we'll see what we what we when we get it here it might be by the end of this year it might be very early in January but we will have samples of, of 90. I also got today uh, a chance to look at the first uh, deco samples of the matching passenger cars to go with those locomotives and they look wonderful so uh, I was able to approve a lot of those um, uh, today and get that that process rolling so for those waiting for a Strasburg uh, set to arrive uh, you're you're in you You'll, you'll, you'll be very happy uh, in, the, in the not too distant future. Uh, when will the baby K4s arrive? They should make it by the end of the year. Knock on wood, fingers crossed. Uh, they're on the same boat as our Vision Line 21010 So uh, when that container arrives, it'll be a quick unload and out the door. We expect them uh, uh, in the next two weeks or so. Uh, but again, uh, everything I say as far as the shipping schedule goes right now has a giant asterisk on it. Uh, because some things arrive a day or two ahead of schedule, some things arrive a week or two behind schedule. Um, we are also relevant to tonight, waiting on our, uh, our CW80, our new CW80 transformers. They should be in soon as well. So if you're looking for a new AC transformer, uh, as your layouts grow, uh, you'll have uh, you'll have that uh, that coming down the line also. Um, so 2022 catalog release date uh, will be in uh, mid-January. I don't remember the date off the top of my head. I've, I've been running around so much with things, but uh, the catalog's coming together quite well. Uh, we're working on uh, on all of that uh, and, uh, and, and going to go, what transformer power supply do you recommend for the 1959 American Flyer set? Uh, don't apologize for asking questions, Justin, please. Uh, those are... Uh, that's why we're here. Um, I think you would probably be okay. I, I'd have to check and see whether you have one of the DC or AC American Flyer sets. And I'm not familiar enough with the 1959 set to know for sure. Um, if it's an AC set, uh, you should be just fine with our new uh, CW80, uh, which will be coming out, uh, which was, I just said should be arriving here pretty soon. Uh, it's an 80 watt transformer. Uh, and it'll work. It'll work very well for you for American Flyer. Uh, if it's a DC set, uh, you'll probably want to look at uh, another. You have to look outside of Lionel for a variable uh, voltage DC transformer. All of our DC power supplies are a fixed voltage for our um, our line chief sets, and they won't do you any good. Uh, so double check to see whether you've got AC or DC on that one, um, and then. Uh, you can you you can go from there. A good source for American Flyer uh, information is the American Society of S gaugers, uh, and you can uh, check them out there. So variable DC. Okay, thanks, Justin. Uh, yeah, um, MRC makes a variety of good power supplies uh, for that. I would start with them. Um, so, uh, I think it's MRC.com, or if you just put type MRC uh, model train power, you know, transformer into your uh, search engine, I'm sure you'll, you'll pop up to their website and uh, take a look and see what they've, they've got for you. Um, and they'll, they'll be, they'll be perfectly fine for you to start with your, uh, your flyer trains. Uh, so it should be, should be good to go there on that one. Hope, hope we get that set up for you and, um, and get to enjoy that with your, with your kid. That's always fun when you can uh, resurrect uh, an old train uh, and do that. I still have uh, my grandfather's, some of my grandfather's Lionel's that 
uh, every once in a while they get pulled out and put under the Christmas tree. Uh, and they, I run them on new fast track. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, always fun. And it's nostalgia. Uh, definitely definitely a good thing so uh hope i answered a lot of the questions uh tonight uh there's a whole lot more product questions i know i, I didn't get a chance to to cover um tune in for some of the christmas questions and polar questions uh tune in next monday uh at 6 30 on train world tv we'll, we'll i'm sure share the link on our lionel accounts but if you go to the train world's uh facebook or youtube account We'll be on there with our, our buddy Ken Bianco uh, at Train World in New York talking all about uh, Christmas items. We'll also uh, do a little bit of uh, a sneak peek look at the Vision Line Class A again uh, and talk a little bit about uh, things that are uh, arriving soon for the end of the year and whatnot. And by, by Monday, I'll probably have a whole lot more new information as we get more containers in over the next couple of days. It's, uh, it's a fever pitch at Lionel right now. We've got two shifts working to, to handle all the inbound and outbound um, shipments uh, and get everybody what they they want for the holidays. So uh, we're all working hard as a company to, to make sure we get you uh, a happy Christmas um, this year or uh, and whatever other holidays you, you may be be celebrating. Um, and we're uh, we're very happy happy to be doing that. Um, one other question we got here: notice we we got new P forty two for the Lion Chief stuff. Any uh, unique traditional scale items uh, we can expect soon? Yep. Um, I won't let too many cats out of the bag just yet on the, the, the next catalog in January, but it is one of the biggest we've done in a long time. Uh, it's a very aggressive catalog with lots of uh, new uh, O scale and uh, traditional uh, offerings coming out. So uh, get excited. Uh, it's going to be a, a big one. And uh, I'm sure as we get into to January, We'll have lots of uh, lots of fun things to talk about, and I look very much forward to to sharing that with all of you. Um, and as, as we move on, so with that, we've we've gone now for uh, about forty five minutes or so. Uh, appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, this is a lot of fun for us to do and, and share the the hobby with all of you. And it's nice to be sitting down at my workbench, uh, even if it's just to sit and chat uh, for for an hour with with all you guys as. Uh, as, as our extended Lionel family. So to everyone out there, wish you the best and safest and happiest of holidays. We'll probably see you one more time before, uh, before Christmas. So we'll, uh, we'll cover things, some more things there, and then we'll keep this series running like we did last year through the colder months uh, as you've got your train still set up, or as you, you maybe you get your first train and you want to expand and, uh, and try some new techniques. Uh, we'll, we'll cover a variety of modeling tips and tricks uh, in the months ahead. Uh, until things get warm enough outside for us all to go out and enjoy uh, other activities for a little bit. Um, but it's always always train time here at uh, Lionel, and uh, we're happy to have you all on board. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I'll see you Monday night on Train World TV and back here uh, two weeks from tonight for the next Workbench Wednesday. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, and have a good day. <laughs>